the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Is it too loud? No? Okay, good. This will be a short lecture because the chalk is very tiny. Ah, okay, there's more. So maybe it won't be a short lecture. So uh, my name is Rocky, and uh, you don't have to refer to me as your prof professor day or uh, doctor, uh, either Rocky or Il Magnifico. It, it's, <laughs> it's up to you. Okay, so the title of these lectures that I'll be giving this week is about a subject is about a subject that I've been uh, working on about for the last 10 years, and it's gravitational particle production. And uh, I like this subject uh, very much because it combines uh, general relativity and particle physics. And everybody should love both of those subjects, general relativity and particle physics. So the plan for these five lectures um, is lecture one today will be introduction and uh, background and just a little bit of history. And lecture, the second lectures tomorrow um, will be scalar fields. And on uh, Wednesday, the second lecture on scalar fields. Now, why such a concentration on scalar fields? Because, well, there's been one scalar field discovered. That's the Higgs. Uh, but scalar fields are a little bit easier. And if we understand all of the subtleties and things that go into gravitational particle production of scalar fields, it will be easier to understand uh, the more complicated cases of uh, fermions and I will do spin one half and spin three half and then uh, what else will I do of course will be bosons And I will do massive spin one and massive spin two. So there will be a lot of subtleties with uh, fermions and um, spin three halves and uh, massive spin one and massive spin two. And having the background of having understood deeply scalar fields will make things a lot, of it, a lot interesting. And uh, if there's time, there are other things on Friday I will talk about uh, that, I, that I find interesting, therefore you should find interesting. So I understand everyone's a graduate student, either in astrophysics or particle physics. If you are in condensed matter physics, raise your hand. Okay, you have to leave, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, but uh, you know, the field theories that are developed for particle physics have a lot of applications for condensed matter physics. And it's always difficult for me to know uh, people's backgrounds. And um, 
I, in the US at least, many people who are in astrophysics or cosmology have only lightly touched, partic uh, lightly touched particle physics. And some people who are in particle physics have only lightly touched general relativity. So today I'll give a little, I'll take the salient points of general relativity and, and uh, particle physics that I will use throughout the lectures. Okay, gravitational particle production, which I will usually abbreviate as GGP. And this is cosmological gravitational particle production. So uh, why do we care about gravitational particle production? Well, why as a particle physicist would you care about cosmology? What do you use cosmology for? Well, one thing is to use the Big Bang as a, an accelerator to create particles. So God did not have enough money to create the, the um, CERN. So what she did was to create the Big Bang, which had energy to create particles. Now, this allows us to use thermal processes to create particles with mass comparable to the temperature. How large of a mass can we study? Well, how large was the maximum temperature in the universe? Now, if we follow the ideas of inflation, which I will assume, there is a maximum temperature to the radiation-dominated universe which is denoted as a reheat temperature, T sub RH. And of course, reheat is a misnomer because it was never heated before. And we do this in cosmology, there's recombination. Well, it was never combined before, but nevertheless, we call it recombination. Now, we don't know what the reheat temperature was after inflation. We don't know what the maximum temperature of the radiation-dominated universe was, but it could be as low, say, as uh, 100 GeV. And some people claim it could be even lower, but I like to think of 100 GeV as a temperature necessary for baryogenesis to occur. So something associated with the weak scale. Now, uh, gravitational particle production can produce particles with a mass comparable to the expansion rate of the universe at the end of inflation, which, so a, this sub E will be the end of inflation, which is comparable to the expansion rate of the universe during inflation, which may be as large as 10 to the 14 GeV. So if we're interested in probing nature, particle physics on very large mass scale, we're not sure we can use the thermal processes, but perhaps we can use gravitational particle production. So that's one advantage of gravitational particle production, 
to produce particles that have a mass larger than uh, the thermal bath of the early universe. And of course, 10 to the 14 GeV is much larger than uh, can be probed terrestrially. Another reason to be interested in gravitational particle production is that it's not optional. The expansion of the universe will create particles um, as well, there's a little way out having to do with conformal invariance in the matter action. But if the matter action is not conformally invariant, for instance, if you have a mass, then gravitational particle production is not optional, can't be turned off. All right, um, so that's one reason to uh, be interested in gravitational particle production is that it can produce uh, massive particles. Another reason to be interested in gravitational particle production is gravitational particle production can uh, produce dark matter. Now, what do we know about dark matter? And the word know I use advisedly. advisedly. Uh, I don't think scientists should use the words know and believe, but what observations, what do observations tell us about dark matter? There's only one thing that observations tell us about dark matter, that is it has gravitational interactions doesn't tell us anything else. The only thing we can deduce from observations is that dark matter has gravitational interactions. Uh, what if dark matter has only gravitational interactions? This, when I say this, it greatly annoys my experimental friends who spend their life deep underground in salt mines and ground, in tunnels looking for dark matter, and I tell them, you're wasting your time. It only has gravitational interactions. And they never speak to me again. Um, this could be involved in baryogenesis. Uh, this is a subject that has not received a lot of attention. And uh, I will point out that gravitational particle production is the key to understanding um, uh, fluctuations in the CMB and the um, uh, seed perturbations that grew to become large-scale structure. So in the idea of inflation, gravitational particle production is inherently a quantum process. And it is this quantum process that produces the fluctuations in the microwave background radiation and also the fluctuations that grow to become galaxies, stars, planets, people, poodles, everything. So you, each person here, is a amplified quantum fluctuation. Doesn't that make you feel good? You're an amplified quantum fluctuation. If you turn off quantum mechanics, say set h bar to zero, there's nothing. So you exist as a um, result of quantum mechanics. You are an amplified quantum fluctuation. 
Okay, so the reason, there's another reason to study this, and the reason I do it It's really a lot of fun. And it is a combination of quantum field theory and general relativity. And, you know, who does it? Everybody should like either general relativity or quantum field theory. And uh, so, what I will do is this will all be calculations that are semi-classical something will be quantized the thing that will be thing that will be quantized is a, I'll call it a spectator field so I will have a classical general relativity so general relativity gravity will be classical providing an expanding universe that's uh, the result of some other scalar field, but then I will put another, stick another scalar field or fermion field or vector field or massive spin two field into a classically expanding universe. So I was going to lecture about my theory of quantum gravity, but I haven't developed it yet. So next year I will talk about quantum gravity. All right, so um, are there any questions before I continue? And let me say, please ask questions at any time. I won't guarantee I will answer any questions, but feel free to ask any questions. Good. <clears throat> so the, idea, the history of the idea of gravitational particle production is... Um, an interesting history. It goes back to 1939 in a work by someone you've heard about Schrodinger in 1939 was the first person to realize that the just the expansion of the universe creates particles. So Schrodinger wrote a paper in 1939 called The Proper Vibrations of the Expanding Universe. It was published in Physica and it's accessible and it's easy to read because it, he had the uh, good taste to publish it in English. So I, I can read it. And this was uh, sort of an interesting paper. It was published in 1939, and Schrodinger wrote that it was a very important paper, but he never referenced it. And he didn't do any follow-up work. And it was not referenced until the 1960s. It had no citations until the 1960s. Well, 1939, there was some something going on in Europe, and Schrodinger was actually a stateless refugee. A, uh, he had escaped from Germany in 1933, escaped from um, Austria in 1939, and he decided that uh, with war in Europe between Germany and France about to occur, he would go someplace safe, so he went to Belgium. His political instincts were not very great. <laughs> so he actually submitted this paper in 1939 when he was stateless and, and a refugee and running for his life. He was uh, declared politically unreliable by the Nazis, and that's sort of a death sentence if the Nazis ever got their hands on him. 
Now, uh, in this paper, it's an interesting paper, uh, in the sense that Schrodinger had the insight and the intuition, but there were some technical problems with the paper. First of all, it was 1939, and to do this problem properly requires quantum field theory, which was not really, did not really start to be developed maybe until after the Second World War in the late 40s. So he just used quantum mechanics, um, and he, again, made some missteps, but nevertheless, he had the intuition and the insight to understand what would happen. And I'll read a couple of quotes from his 1939 paper. He wrote, the decomposition of an arbitrary wave function into proper vibrations is rigorous. What does he mean by that? He meant that even in an expanding universe, a particle's wave function can be decomposed into positive and negative energy modes. So again, this is just quantum mechanics. So either positive or negative uh, frequency modes. So even in an expanding universe, you can write a wave function for a particle like this. Then he wrote, these two proper vibrations cannot be rigorously separated in the expanding universe. That means to say, if in a certain moment of time, only one of them is present, the other can turn up in the course of time. So if you start either with pure incoming or outgoing waves, the in and out waves will be mixed in general due to the expansion of the universe. Then he wrote, generally speaking, this is a phenomenon of outstanding importance. With particles, it would mean production or annihilation of matter merely by expansion. So Schrodinger had the insight that just the expansion of the universe creates particles. Then he wrote, alarmed by these prospects, I have investigated the question in more detail. Then to the conclusion, he writes, there will be a mutual adulteration of positive and negative frequency turns in the course of time, giving rise to what in the introduction I call the alarming phenomenon. Schrodinger was alarmed by the creation of particles. So in 1939, war is about to break out, Schrodinger's running for his life, a price was on his head in Germany, and what was he alarmed about? Creation of a single particle per Hubble time And today, H0 to the minus 1 is about 10 to the 10 years. Per Hubble volume, and the Hubble volume is H0 to the minus 3, which is 10 to the, about 10 to the 57 kilometers cubed. With the Hubble energy, Is anyone frightened, by the alarmed by the creation of a single particle sometime in the next 10 billion years, somewhere in a volume of 10 to the 57 cubic kilometers with an energy of 10 to the 33 electron volts? If that really scares you, seek psychological help. All right. Now, as I said, Schrodinger made some missteps in this. He thought you could create photons, 
in the expansion of the universe, but we will understand that you can't because uh, photons, um, gauge fields, massless gauge fields are conformally coupled to gravity and that prevents the creation of photons. Probably Schrodinger thought this was some um, indication that either quantum mechanics was wrong or general relativity was wrong. He looked for a cosmological model where there is no particle creation and he discovered one. He discovered the Milne cosmology, which essentially is just a piece of Minkowski space written in different coordinates. So he discovered in Minkowski space you do not create particles. Okay, so that's enough of the history. I always forget and wear black slacks while giving blackboard talks. It's not a good idea. Okay, so I, before going into the details, I'd like to give a um, sort of an intuitive picture of why uh, there's particle production. Expansion of the universe creates particles. just the expansion of the universe. This is an example of particle creation in an external field. So an example of this happens and nothing fancy in QED. Something that's known as the Schwinger effect. So the Schwinger effect is in the presence of an electric field, an external electric field, the vacuum is unstable. Hey, people, who's heard of the Schwinger effect? Okay, a few people have heard of the Schwinger effect. Good. So um, let's imagine, let's take a look at the vacuum. And in the vacuum, say there's electrons and positrons coming in and out of the vacuum because of the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So if you, the Casimir effect proves that if you would look at the vacuum just around us on sufficiently small scales, you would see uh, particles coming in and out of the vacuum. Now let's imagine the creation and annihilation of particles in the vacuum in the presence of an electric field. Well, what's going to happen is that the electric field is going to accelerate electrons in one direction and positrons in the other direction because of the, they have opposite charge. So there's particle production if the energy gained um, in acceleration from the electric field, if this energy over a Compton wavelength exceeds the particle's rest mass, and let's talk about electrons. So the electron and positron comes out of the vacuum, it's accelerated by the electric field, 
if it gains an energy equal to the electron rest mass over a Compton wavelength of the electron, then you would produce particles. So in order for this to happen, you need a certain critical value of the electric field. And um, so the critical value, there's only one dimensionful parameter in this consideration, that's the electron mass. So the critical electric field is going to be just dimensionally the electron mass squared. You can think, well, the uh, charge of the electron has to enter. So it enters in the denominator because if the charge of the electron is increased, then the critical field you would expect to decrease. Uh, so then I'll put in C cubed in H bar and um, only in the next two minutes will you ever see me write H bar and C. Uh, you work in natural units. Uh, so this is about 10 to the 16 volt per centimeter. So here's an experiment you can do at home. Go in your basement and make an electric field of 10 to the 16 volts per centimeter and you will observe electrons and positrons coming out of the vacuum. 10 to the 16 volts per centimeter is a rather large electric field and it, that is not possible. But what is possible is uh, not putting batteries together, but using high-powered lasers So again, just uh, figuring out what sort of intensity would correspond to a critical electric field of 10 to the 16 volts per centimeter. It would be, I'll write C again and also put pi in, but since I'm a cosmologist, most of the time I will set pi equal to one. This is known as the small circle approximation. Um, and this is about 10 to the 30 watt, watts per square centimeter. This has not been achieved with, with high powered lasers yet, but they promise my friends who work on high-powered lasers, that it will happen around 2030. They will have lasers powerful enough, according to nature, to, I'll quote nature in the title of the issue, physicists are planning lasers powerful enough to rip apart the fabric of space and time. Doesn't that sound violent? They're going to rip apart the fabric of space and time. And according to Gerard Moreau, who won the Nobel Prize for, shared the Nobel Prize for developing high-powered lasers, uh, this will, you know, they do the usual Livingston graph, the um, um, Moore's law graph, plotting the in log logarithm of the intensity versus linear time. And in the year 2030, I don't know whether this is calendar year or fiscal year. Um, they will produce lasers powerful enough for something that's known as light materialization. So maybe you will see in, by 2030 or thereabouts, um, the fabric of space and time being ripped apart and particles being created. Now, as usual in uh, nature, Things that are difficult 
to do or impossible to do in the laboratory, you can find some place in the universe where it's done. And uh, large magnetic fields are associated, have, should have associated with them large electric fields. And you can sort of guess, just again, just dimensionally, what a critical magnetic field would be. And uh, again, uh, mass of the electron is the only uh, dimensionful parameter. And this is about 5 times 10, 10 to the 13 Gauss. Again, this is a very large magnetic field. You don't produce it in the laboratory. But the Crab pulsar, which is pretty well understood, has magnetic fields of about 3 times 10 to the 13 Gauss. And magnetars are believed to have magnetic fields of 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 Gauss. So strong magnetic fields um, uh, imply the existence of strong electric fields. So perhaps someplace out in the universe, there are places where the fabric of space and time is being ripped apart and you're producing particles and antiparticles. Now, there are many unexplained phenomena associated with pulsars and magnetars, etc. So perhaps the Schwinger effect is uh, responsible. <clears throat> now, it's called the Schwinger effect because usually a phenomenon is named after the last person to work on it. It was hinted at in the 1930s by... Heisenberg and Weisskopf and people talked about it, but Schwinger did the definitive calculation in 1951. Okay, so um, now, so we understand it in uh, the Schwinger effect as having to do with the vacuum and and uh, in the presence of an external field. The same thing, you can understand Hawking radiation in the same way. That you have an external field, a gravitational field, that's disturbing the vacuum. Near the horizon of a black hole, you can accelerate particles in one direction. Because of the tidal gravitational field, it will accelerate particles and antiparticles in different directions. And if the energy gained in acceleration from the, gra from, from the tidal gravitational field over the Compton wavelength is larger than the mass, then you would create the particles. So particle creation in an external field, we see with gravity, we see with electric fields, and we can also see with the expansion of the universe. Yes? Um, well, there is a gravitational, uh, a tidal gravitational field around a black hole, right? I'm sorry? Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, there's uh, tidal gravitational fields because the gravitational field strength depends upon the distance from the black hole. And around the horizon, the velocities are close to the velocity of light. So because of the tidal gravitational field, it will rip the particles apart from the vacuum, the particles and antiparticles across from the vacuum, and produce particles. Now, Hawking would be upset if I waved my hands and said, look, I understand particle creation but, uh, in that way, but that's, you know, a... An, in, a motivation for understanding gravitational particle creation due to the expansion of the universe. Uh, I'm not sure I answered your question. I answered a question. I don't know if it was your question, but you, you can talk to me after. Thank you. 
All right, so what about the expanding universe? Again, in the absence of the expansion of the universe, I can picture a particle and an antiparticle coming in and out of the vacuum. Now, it, with the expansion of the universe, the particles come in and out of the vacuum, but they can get caught in the expansion of the universe and pulled apart in the same way the critical electric field can pull the particles from the, uh, in the vacuum apart. So it is the expansion of the universe that will pull the, um, the particles and antiparticles apart. And if the, you would have particle production, if the energy gained an acceleration from the expansion of the universe over a Compton wavelength is larger than the mass. So you have to have a, a velocity and acceleration that's comparable to the mass. And it has to be relativistic. Now in the expansion of the universe, where is the velocity comparable to C? The expansion velocity is comparable to C at H to the minus one, the Hubble radius. So in the Swinger effect, the lifetime of the vacuum is um, e to the minus e, the electric field that you produce, over the critical value. And uh, the critical value is approximately um, equal to 1 over, it's equal to mass squared. Here, uh, you would expect something like e to the minus m over h. And we, we will see this factor arising. And again, the Think of the reason this arises, you see it in the arithmetic, but the reason it arises, the reason H comes up, is because at the Hubble radius, the velocity is comparable to the velocity of light. Uh, you need an expansion rate comparable to the mass of the particle that's being produced. Okay? So if the expansion rate H is much smaller than the mass, then there's an exponential suppression. Okay? Thank you. All right, so now let's uh, fast forward about 70 years and uh, say, okay, now let's imagine we're going to consider this in quantum field theory. Now, everyone studies quantum field theory in Minkowski space. Of course, that's a stupid statement. Everyone studies quantum field theory in Minkowski space. If you go downtown in Florence and ask people passing you, did you study quantum field theory in Minkowski space, they would run away from you, likely. <laughs> so remember, but everyone here probably has had some exposure to quantum field theory in Minkowski space. And um, if you're a particle physicist, and if you were asked to classify a particle, you would say it, a particle is an irreducible representation of the Poincaré group. That's how you would classify particles and how it transforms. Um, but the expanding universe
is not Poincaré invariant. Why isn't the universe Poincaré invariant? There's no time, great, thank you. No time translation invariance. So the, the expanding universe is not Poincaré invariant. So the notion of a particle is approximate. There's various words you can use. a little bit fuzzy. So what you call a particle is ambiguous because uh, the universe is expanding, so you uh, do not have Poincaré invariance. So this, you know, the universe isn't expanding very rapidly now, so it has no real effect. You know, you can still have particle physicists even though you can't really de technically completely define a particle. So if you want to be a particle physicist, still go ahead and be a particle physicist. Don't be alarmed. You'll just be an approximate particle physicist. All right, so the program will be start with cosmological expansion. then this will lead to a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And I'll put a little hat on it. It's not H. The expansion rate is the Hamiltonian. And this will lead to mixing positive and negative frequency modes, Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon, which will lead, which we will interpret as particle creation. Good. All right, this finishes my introduction. And now what I would like to do is to have everything you need to know about general relativity in uh, 15 minutes. And then we'll, we will take a break for some coffee. Now, I imagine most of you have had, who has had a course on GR? Wow. So that's different than in the US. In the US, most graduate students, even in particle physics, would not have had a course on GR. So if I say the word tetrad, a smaller group, and, and, and some people are not so sure. OK, how about uh, Vierbein? So more Germans than uh, Greeks, I guess. <laughs> And spin connections and all that crap. That's uh, it's you know. So there's a little bit more to it. Okay, uh, if I say the words Belenfante, who, who's the other? Who's the other dude? <laughs> Belenfante, Rosenfeld, stress energy tensor. Even if you, okay. So let me just quickly go through this, and I'll point you to some references uh, that will help you. Ba -bum -bum -bum. And I find nothing is more enjoyable in a lecture than hearing things that I already understand. So if you already understand it, you will enjoy it. And if you don't understand it, I don't think the, this part will help. So, but I'll do it anyway. So I, uh, this is a little bit of general relativity. And for notation, I will use the Landau 
lift shit. Uh, Timelight convention. So um, this is, there's a textbook, a very, a phone book written by, nobody knows what a phone book is anymore, but a very big book written by Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, MTW at Caltech. We refer to this as misery, trouble, and woe. <laughs> so the... Uh, this is the time light convention, so it's minus plus plus in MTW. So the metric will be most, will have a signature of mostly negative. Okay, so the metric is real valued and symmetric. And there's an inverse metric. And uh, so G mu nu is the metric. Uh, there's an inverse metric. G mu nu times down times G mu nu up is delta. And there's the determinant of the metric, G, and the um, invariant volume element, it's the square root of G times D4x. Then um, there's the Christoffel symbol, which involves derivatives of the metric, the Raymond tensor, which um, is a contraction uh, which involves uh, derivatives of the uh, Christoffel symbol, the Ricci tensor, the Ricci scalar. These are names that everyone should have heard, uh, mostly everyone should have heard. And uh, after two weeks of raising and lowering indices, uh, you end up with an Einstein tensor. And uh, I will denote this as capital G mu nu is R mu nu minus one half G mu nu times the Ricci scalar R. So the Einstein Hilbert action is minus one over 16 pi times Newton's constant. And there's a matter action. No, not R, I always want to do that, times some matter Lagrangian. And something that we will encounter when we do massive spin two fields is counter to what you may have been told when you studied general relativity. You may have been told that general coordinate invariance leads to general relativity. So you start out, which also leads to a massless spin two field. So the usual way it's taught is general covariance leads to general relativity, which is understood in quantum mechanics in terms of a massless spin two field. But that is not the logical progression because general coordinate invariance does not uniquely lead to GR. So the correct direction of this is that a massless spin two field leads to general relativity, which has general coordinate invariance. So there are other formulations, uh, Nambu's worked on this and other people, of uh, having a general coordinate invariance that is not general relativity. So Einstein made some, he was lucky, this guy was just lucky, right? You know, he made some leaps 
in uh, trying to understand things to come up with general relativity based on general coordinate invariance. So the direction really is a massless spin two field leads to general relativity, not that general coordinate invariance leads to a massless spin two field. So you could imagine that uh, general relativity was not developed until the late 1940s when people started taking quantum field theory seriously. But luckily Einstein was ahead of the game. Yes? Isn't there some theorem about the way that the temperatures are connected in Einstein's equation? That what, sorry? The way that uh, the Einstein tensor g mu nu equals r mu nu minus 1 half u mu nu r. Isn't that like some, isn't there no other way to combine the tensors? That's right. That, 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 that doesn't have to do with coordinate invariance? Well, no, it, it, it's a, it, it, in, in, in combinations of uh, using the metric. So is, there are other possibilities that you could write. Uh, for instance, uh, you could write a constant here. Let's just imagine you're crazy enough to write something like minus lambda g mu nu. That would be ugly, right? But you could do that. And um, there's also, so this, you can use, it could have been a scalar field. That's what Nambu worked on, to have scalar gravity. There's SVT, scalar vector tensor, and all these other possibilities for, for gravity. But if you say gravity is a, um, is, is associated with a massless spin two field, then you directly end up with the Einstein-Hilbert action. And I'll, I'll talk about this in the last lecture. Scale is mediating what, sorry? Only repulsive. Uh, um, no, the, you, you can get away. So pseudoscalar is mediate repulsive forces, but scalar is you can have attractive forces. So the Einstein field equations come from variation of the action with respect to g mu nu. And uh, you end up with uh, g mu nu is 8 pi g t mu nu, where uh, t mu nu <clears throat> This is related to the variation of the matter action with respect to g mu nu. Now I will uh, use 8 pi g defined as kappa and 8 pi g is 1 over the Planck mass squared. So um, it's, and the Planck mass defined this way is about 10 to the 18 GeV. Now one subtlety, um, let's see, this will take about 10 minutes. So let's uh, break here, and I'll come back with a subtlety about the stress-energy tensor, 
that you can't use the canonical stress energy tensor or the new the stress energy tensor. This is uh, something that this is known as the Hilbert stress energy tensor. And I'll, I'll talk about the difficulties using, there are two difficulties using the neither or the canonical stress energy tensor. One is that it won't be symmetric in mu and nu, and the other is that it doesn't capture the energy associated with internal things like spin. And I'll pick that up in a minute uh, after I caffeinate. So we take a break now. Two hours? No, no uh, ten minutes. Uh, whatever. When, when people start coming back, I start lecturing. because you can't hear me in the back, right? All right, I'll use the microphone. Ah. Okay, uh, the other thing that uh, I will just write that we will have use for is the trace of the stress tensor. Uh, which uh, T mu nu is the trace, trace of the stress tensor. And it's just uh, G mu nu, you know, raising the indice. All right, so there's another stress tensor that um, you can encounter. And this is sometimes called the canonical stress tensor or the neither stress tensor. And this is often encountered in introductory quantum field theory books. Uh, let's say there's some field phi. Um, and the problem with this canonical stress tensor is it's not guaranteed to be symmetric in mu and nu. And since we're going to have uh, g mu nu equals t mu nu, and the Einstein tensor is symmetric in mu and nu, we have to have the 
um, stress tensor symmetric in mu and nu. So this canonical stress tensor generally will not be used. And there's another reason for it not to be used is this canonical stress tensor does not properly account for the energy density associated with intrinsic angular momentum, like spin. So this must be modified by the Bellinfante-Rosenfeld prescription and there's a nice description of that in the first volume of Weinberg's Quantum Field Theory textbook. And the Bellinfanti-Rosenfeld prescription to fix the canonical stress tensor that it's symmetric and accounts for spin would be equivalent to the Hilbert action. Okay. So for the matter Lagrangian, uh, people who have studied general relativity will be familiar with the fact that we want to promote Minkowski stress tensor to curve space. And the way to promote it to curve space uh, is one for scalars, vectors, and tensors. Uh, you do two things. You take the, of course, the uh, Minkowski metric going to G mu nu. And derivative, replace derivatives by covariant derivatives, which is a normal derivative plus Christoffel symbols, etc. And um, uh, promote the tensors to the uh, uh, in the correct way. Now this doesn't work for half integer spins. So there has to be another formalism to promote Minkowski quantum field theory to a general curve space formalism. And this is a, for, a very beautiful formalism of general relativity that originally traces back to Cartan and uh, goes by the name, what did Cartan, let's see, there's some French, what did Cartan originally, moving frames? Hmm? Stand up and say it so I... Got it, good. <laughs> uh, so Cartan introduced this, it's known as Vierbeins, if you're German, tetrads in the English speaking world, and if you do supergravity, it's known as frame fields. And it's either four legs, a four a set of four, et cetera. So the way the Vierbein, and we will use this because we're going to do gravitational particle production of spin one half and spin three halves field. So at every space time point, you can erect a set of local inertial coordinates And these local co inertial coordinates I'll call y sub x mu, or let's call it alpha. So at every space-time point x, I'm going to have a local inertial coordinates system. And at that space-time point, the metric is eta mu nu 
is just a Minkowski metric. Uh, let's call it alpha, al no, sorry, eta alpha beta for reasons that will be clear soon. So in, in a general, coordinate system, so not in the local inertial coordinate system, um, the metric, uh, now I'll use mu and nu, which is a function of x, times eta mu nu, eta alpha beta. So this is a tensor, and this is just the way tensors transform in general relativity. So I can abbreviate this as uh, this is an E alpha mu, E beta nu, And this E alpha mu is the Virbind, the tetrad. So this carries a flat space index, early alphabet index alpha, and a curved space index mu. Nope. So the early alphabet indices, the alpha and beta, will be raised and lowered by the Minkowski metric, and the mid alphabet, mu, nu, et cetera, will be raised and lowered by the metric g mu nu. So this looks like a tensor, but actually it's a set of four covariant vectors. So there's four covariant vectors, alpha goes from zero to three, covariant vectors mu. All right. All right, so now to promote a Minkowskian theory to curve space, uh, we're going to contract vectors, whoop, up, up, tensors um, into frame fields. So if you have a vector, say V mu, that you can write as E alpha mu, V alpha, where this is the flat space vector. And if you have a contravariant vector, And you have to replace derivatives by covariant derivatives. And the covariant derivatives Uh, 
that represents the covariant derivatives is the, something that looks familiar, but it carries the Virbein And this is known as the spin connection. And the spin connection and this sigma alpha beta is the generator of the Lie algebra associated uh, with the representation. With the field representation. And um, I hesitate to write this out, but uh, let, me, let me write it out just for fun. Oh, sigma alpha beta, E alpha mu, E alpha nu, I hate getting these indices correct, G sigma nu, something approximately equal to that. And sometimes, sometimes this is called the spin connection. Sometimes the whole thing is called the spin connection. And uh, there are various um, conventions that uh, different textbooks will follow. Uh, right, so for a spinner field, sigma alpha beta, is the commutator, and there's a one-fourth here, sometimes there's a one-fourth there, the commutator of gamma alpha, gamma beta. All right, um, then finally, Uh, you can define a stress tensor, T alpha mu, and again, alpha is a Minkowski index, a flat index, mu is a curved index. So instead of the uh, variation of the matter metric with respect to g mu nu is the variation of the matter metric with respect to the Virbein. And then you can construct the usual stress tensor with curved indices as um, Okay. All right, so just tuck that away for now. And on Wednesday, when we do spinner fields, gravitational production of spinner fields, we will use the Virbein formalism. Okay. What is the difference between a stress mask and a normal Forman uh, transformation? Yeah. So a tetrad is, uh, it's not a tensor, it is four vectors. So there's, it's E, say, alpha mu. Alpha just labels is zero to three. There's four covariant vectors mu. 
So this by itself is not a vector or a tensor. It's a set of four covariant vectors. So it's not, it looks like a tensor because it has two indices. You know, I, uh, generally people you meet on the street in Florence, if you ask them what is a tensor, they'll say it's something with two indices. Well, that's not, that's wrong. It depends on how it transforms, right? So this is a set of four vector fields. Yes. Yeah. Or actually for anything except the spin connection for uh, scalars is zero. You know, how it transforms the generator of the uh, Lie algebra for scalars is zero. So, you know, for scalars, you don't have to worry about this. And for vectors and tensors, you can um, do the tetrad formalism but I won't do it because it's a pain in the ass. But it's necessary for fields that are spinners because it captures the um, internal angular momentum. And for instance, you know, if you look at the Dirac equation, you have d mu uh, gamma mu, gamma mu d mu, and you know the Dirac algebra for the gammas in flat space, but then what is the Dirac algebra for the gammas in curved space? You know, you would hide this by defining, and this is looking ahead to what I'll do, gamma mu with an underscore, which would be E alpha mu times uh, gamma alpha, again, the alphas refer to the Minkowskian space. So this gamma alpha is the usual gamma matrix that everyone is familiar with. And the curvature of space time and all that stuff is carried by the Vierbein. So again, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail on this Wednesday. Okay. Now the next... Uh, next concept I want to talk about is conformal symmetry. Uh, let's imagine a transformation of the metric tensor goes to some other metric tensor, uh, which is equal to, it's convenient to write 2 omega of x and omega is a real finite function of x, the space-time point x. So this is sometimes called a conformal, sometimes a vial, sometimes a scale transformation. And uh, actually, there are papers written arguing about this is conformal, no, it's vile, no, it's scale, and people get all worked up. I don't care what the hell you call it. This, just look at the equation. This is the definition of it. So this transformation locally stretches or shrinks space-time. So at every space-time point x, you are distorting the geometry. 
you're sh expanding it or shrinking it, and it can be expanded or shrinked differently at different space-time points. It is not a general coordinate transformation. A general coordinate transformation relabels coordinates but leaves uh, the geometry unaffected. So you can change coordinates, but you're not changing geometry. Here, you are changing the geography. You're changing the geometry. You are distorting space-time. It's not a coordinate transformation. A conformal transformation does not leave the geometry unaffected. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the and whether the matter action is conformally invariant or not will be very important when we do gravitational particle production. Ba -ba 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 -ba. So in this formal transformation, uh, linearly, delta g mu nu is 2 omega of x times g mu nu. Now remember the matter action Ah, uh, come on. So the matter action is defined this way, and the variation of the matter action with respect to g mu nu we can just write this way. So this leads, this, let's see, there's probably this equation still on the board here for the Hilbert stress tensor. Right. So if I use delta G, come on. The variation of the matter action how does the matter action change under a conformal transformation? Okay. So, uh, because delta g mu nu is written up there, and I just put delta g mu nu into that. So this, how the matter action changes under a conformal transformation is just related, so I'll just say it's proportional to this tr trace of the stress tensor, T mu mu, right? G mu nu times T mu nu is just the trace of the stress tensor. So if the trace of the stress tensor vanishes, the matter Lagrangian will be invariant under, coordinate tra under conformal transformation. So if I do this rescaling, if the stress tensor, if the trace of the stress tensor for the matter field is invariant, then it's, the conformal transformation has no effect. Now, in, the, uh, in five minutes, I will describe the uh, metric, the line element for a Friedman, Roberts, and Walker metric. So this will be a little bit ahead of time, but many of you have seen it. Here, eta is conformal time. So 
Here, the metric for an expanding flat universe in conformal time is conformally equivalent to Minkowski space. So the Friedman expansion stretches space-time. It stretches space and time. That's what the Friedman expansion does. Um, so if the matter, so you can think, so it, it's a conformal transformation. The Friedman metric in conformal time, conformal time eta, is conformally equivalent to the Minkowski metric by this conformal factor A squared, the scale factor. So if the matter action is conformally invariant, the expansion of the universe is not going to affect the matter action if the matter action is conformally invariant, at least the expansion of the universe in the flat Friedman model. So whether the matter action is conformally invariant or not will be important when we talk about particle creation. And I'll also note that this is a classical definition of conformal invariance. There's no scale associated with a conformally invariant theory. Now, um, it, this is a classical consideration, but in quantum field theory, you have to introduce a scale for renormalization. So introducing a scale of renormalization implies that conformal invariance will be broken by quantum effects. But when I say conformally invariant, I uh, will just talk about classically conformally invariant. Okay, so now I turn to the organizer and I look at my watch and it's noon. So should I stop now? I'm happy to keep going for another three hours or another 10 minutes or another half hour. So, or, or should I stop? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I can do it. Now, so that's all the introductory. Now I want to talk about the Friedman expansion. Now I will talk about something interesting, the Friedman expansion, FRW. So the Friedman universe describes a universe that is spatially homogeneous and isotropic. So of course homogeneous means it's the same at every point. Isotropic means it's the same in every direction. So for a homogeneous isotropic space, one can find a frame, find a reference frame, where we can write the metric of the line element in terms of one dynamical degree of freedom, the scale factor A, So the universe is only homogeneous and isotropic in one reference frame. If you want, feel free to work in any other reference frame, but it will be much more complicated, and my suggestion is work in a reference frame that is uh, homogeneous and isotropic. So in this reference frame, there are coordinates R, theta, and 
phi, and these coordinates, the angular coordinates are in d omega squared. And um, in, uh, during these lectures, I will um, take these coordinates to be co-moving. So it's just a label. So a, an observer co-moving in expansion, minding its own business in the expanding universe, will have constant r, theta, and phi. phi. And the scale factor, I will assume, has mass dimension minus one, so it has a dimension of length. So the physical length is determined by the scale factor in r, theta, and phi will just be, will be, have numbers 17, 12, and five. So I can also write the metric for a spatially flat model where k is equal to zero in terms of dt squared minus a squared of t times dx squared. And I will assume in everything I do that the universe is sp that the space, that it is spatially flat. Now we don't know, the universe today seems to be spatially flat, so the universe at early times was spatially flatter, so this seems to be a good approximation. So A, this is dimensionless, and A has mass dimension minus one. It has units of length. So g mu nu is only a function of time. And the contravariant version Okay, and finally the square root of minus g of the determinant of the metric is a cubed. Now all of my calculations of particle creation will be done in conformal time. I live in conformal time. My Apple Watch is set to conformal time. So conformal time is defined as d eta is dt over a of t. So conformal time eta is dimensionless because a has dimensions of length and time has dimensions of length. And in conformal time, ds squared is a squared of eta times something that looks like the Minkowski metric. So this is conformally Minkowskian, Minkowskian. And an over dot on a, param on a uh, quantity will denote d by dt and a prime 
will denote derivative with respect to conformal time. All right, so um, most of you, many of you at least, are familiar with the usual standard cosmology, but most of you probably work in coordinate time T and not in conformal time. So for instance, the Hubble parameter H is A dot over A. And I can write this in conformal time as A prime over A squared. And this is the Hubble parameter today. The Hubble parameter is the Hubble constant H zero. And as you may be aware, there's a big controversy today over the local value of the Hubble constant compared to the value of the Hubble constant uh, deduced by CMB observations. I will ignore that because in my view, the Hubble constant is a nuisance parameter. I have a colleague at Chicago, Wendy Friedman. Don't tell her I said that. She spent her life determining the Hubble constant. I don't want her to think, I think she spent her life determining a nuisance parameter. So that's the Hubble parameter. And I, we, we will also see the Hubble radius. The Hubble radius d sub h is h to the minus 1. OK, so now we just turn the crank and we um, find the Friedman equation, et cetera. It's an exercise you can do. The zero, zero component of the Ricci tensor is minus three A double dot over A. And this is minus three A double prime over A cubed minus A prime squared over A to the fourth. So the double prime is the second derivative with respect to conformal time. RII, the non-diagonal spatial components of the Ricci tensor vanished. <coughs> These are dots. And it's a similar thing in conformal time. Finally, the Ricci scalar, which will enter a lot in what we do. Okay, so th these are the components of the Ricci tensor. Oh, I guess I can go up down here.
now I want to define the energy density and pressure. And generally, I can write T mu nu as rho plus P times of four velocities. And if I work in a um, space that's homogeneous and isotropic, co-moving with expansion, the four, vector, four velocity is just one, and it has no spatial components. So that's for a co-moving observer. All right, now. I've lost the Einstein equation. <coughs> okay, a to pi g is just kappa. Now, if I wish, if I was really well, in principle, there's no reason not to add a term that's lambda g mu nu. So in the spirit of effective field theories, I should add to, to the Lagrangian every term that's not forbidden by symmetry. So there is no reason to forbid a lambda g mu nu added to the Einstein equation. It's ugly, but there's no reason not to add it. And um, so I can move this. So this was done by Einstein in 1917. The, um, okay, so actually Einstein called it lowercase lambda. So from 1917 to today, the big advance in cosmology has been moving this term to the right-hand side of the equation and promoting little lambda to capital lambda. That has been the advances since 1917. And then I can define a generalized energy density, let's call it, rho star is rho from the energy density and pressure plus lambda over kappa, eight pi g, and a pressure which is the usual uh, thermodynamic pressure minus lambda over kappa. So the cosmological constant is indistinguishable from a generalized energy density and pressure. This was realized in the 1930s by Lemaitre. Okay, so let me do one more thing, and that is put the robertson walker metric into the Einstein equation and use for the stress-energy tensor this. And then we'll be done for the day. So the zero, zero component of the Einstein equation um, gives A double dot over A equal to A double prime over A cubed minus A prime squared over A to the fourth is equal to cap minus kappa over six times rho plus three p.
And this is an equation for the acceleration. Pay attention to that minus sign. If rho plus 3p is positive, then you have deceleration. If rho plus 3p is negative, then the universe accelerates. And uh, using the 0, 0 equation in the I, I equation, you end up with the Friedman equation, A dot over A squared is uh, kappa over 3 times rho. And the rho and p should be understood as including a cosmological constant. So this means 3h squared is kappa rho. That's something that I will use often. Okay, so I will stop here. What I want to do next time is to start with the evolution of rho and uh, look at dust equation of state and vacuum dominated equation of state and construct a cosmological model that starts with domination by some vacuum energy connecting to an expansion dominated by matter. Okay, yes? There's nothing wrong. You can put it on whatever side that you want, and you'll end up with the same. The equations would be the same, except here you would have additional terms. Uh, so if you don't include lambda here, you have to include l additional terms proportional to lambda there. Okay, have a good lunch and uh, see you this afternoon and tomorrow. One more second, please. So since some of you arrived late this morning, let me remind you that the lecture this afternoon will be at uh, 1.45, so 15 minutes earlier than usual. And then we will gather at 4 o'clock at the entrance of GGI, and we will walk together to the Villa of Galileo. And there will be no discussion today. Tomorrow will be the first one for this week. <laughs>